Hi, good morning, everybody. We are really pleased to have our keynote address with Maury Cohen on broad ownership and sustainability. He has his book here, The Future of Consumer Society, with a picture of a market. It reminds me of a farmer's market here, but also in Paris for some reason with the colors. Uh, Maury Cohen is a professor of sustainability at uh, the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He's also a director of the program in science, technology, and society. And uh, he has many other um, titles and uh, accolades as well. He works uh, with Rutgers Global Affairs. He uh, is an associate fellow at the TELUS Institute. Um, the list goes longer. He's also developed SCORI, which is a network of um, researchers, practitioners, um, public policy folks. So. He really um, has reached out far in terms of um, understanding and studying and um, uh, having sustainable, sustainability reach out further. Um, his book is an example of this. He's, uh, he's a bit of a visionary in terms of looking at current trends but looking to the future and um, applying systems thinking in terms of uh, really looking not just at the consumer and the marketing which I think is where his work started off with, but looking at the broader, also um, social, human, economic uh, components of sustainability. And he's going to focus more, perhaps under the influence of this group, on the human aspect. Um, so really look forward to uh, his overall presentation of the book. And then we'll have three discussants who are going to focus each on a different part of the book. Um, and um, then Sally, Sledge uh, and myself are going to continue to, uh, to make some broader comments. So thank you very much, Maureen. Well, thank you very much. Um, just bear with me here for a second while I get myself a little bit um, set up. So first of all, thanks very much for that very gracious uh, and, uh, and kind introduction. Um, Special thanks also to, uh, to Joseph for uh, creating some time to give me an opportunity to speak about, um, about this book. Um, it, um, uh, Joseph and I have been sort of speaking uh, privately uh, for a long time, a uh, number of years, um, about uh, some of the issues that, uh, that are highlighted in this book. And so uh, the opportunity to bring that conversation to, uh, to a wider and larger group um, is, uh, is a much appreciated um, occasion um, for me. Um, let me also say a couple of other things um, about, uh, about the book, The Future of Consumer Society, Prospects for Sustainability um, in the New Economy. Um, this is actually the first opportunity I've had to sort of step out um, post-production to, uh, to talk about the book. It was just published uh, uh, five or six weeks ago in the UK, um, and given the, the logistics of distributing books in the contemporary age, um, it just became available um, a few days ago um, here in the US. Um, and so there's a, there's a scarcity value that the book has because the, the, the copies of the book have not yet really begun to flow through the through the distribution chain. Um, I received a couple of copies from the publisher a few weeks ago and distributed those outward. I uh, gave the last copy that I had to my sister over the, uh, over the holiday New Year period. Um, and so even I, I don't even have a copy of the book in my own possession um, at the moment. So there, there may be some, uh, uh, some financially attractive arbitrage uh, opportunities that you can take advantage of. There are three books that, uh, that Beth has outside. Um, that um, um, that can be uh, potentially turned over for a for a, for a um, useful profit. Um, so this is the last day of this session of this workshop, um, and so I'm I suppose many of you like me by the third day um, of a of a of an event like this I'm pretty fried, and so I'm going to try to keep my comments as uh, as brief as I can here today, give the panel uh, an opportunity to respond, and then hopefully. Um, have enough time to turn things over to all of you um, for a really fruitful and, uh, and fulsome um, discussion. Um, so to begin, um, 
I think there's an inevitable paradox that I have to, um, to address. Um, at Joseph's invitation and, uh, and graciousness, I've had an opportunity to participate in the last couple of, uh, of Kelso workshops uh, and to gain what I think is a pretty good feel and appreciation for this, um, this community. Um, and, um, and it's clear that this is a, a research and a community of policy practice that's very much anchored on the production side of the economy. Um, more specifically, um, and you don't need me to tell you this, um, on, uh, on work and workers um, uh, and how that can be organized um, in better ways than it, than, it, than, it, than it presently is, at least within the mainstream. Um, but um, um, as, a, as a kind of outsider to this community, I've been quite struck um, by the, the rather narrow conception of the social experience that seems to run through this, this community. Um, I realize that people don't work, or many people don't work nine to five lives any longer, but there's a, a distinct impression that I take away, that, that I take away, is that the life experience of, of workers tends to end um, at five o'clock. Um, and again, I don't realize that many people don't work nine to five lives any longer, but um, what I find um, uh, curious is that there's a, a, a lack of conceptualizing the life experience, the social experience of people, you know, beyond the workplace, and a failure to fully recognize that people are also mothers and fathers and wives and, and husbands and soccer coaches. Um, and volunteer firemen, and, and people do all sorts of other things uh, with their lives and with their time outside of the workplace. And so what I'm going to try to do here today, and what the book also does, is to try to create a more holistic impression of, um, of what we might think of as worker consumers. Um, and if we're going to talk about consumption, um, and consumers, and as I do here, and as I, as I do in the book, um, the role of consumer society as a, as a system of social organization, um, it's useful to conceptualize production consumption systems um, in broad and expansive terms. Um, and, um, and to also recognize, because I come out of a tradition of scholarship organized around sustainability science and sustainability studies, that, that production consumption systems also have biophysical um, implications. Um, and the production consumption systems that, uh, that are most prominent um, in my uh, mental conceptualization uh, are organized around housing, um, they're organized around household energy. They're organized around agro-food systems. And they're organized around what we can conceive of as mobility services or transportation in the more conventional um, term. Um, and then, as I mentioned a minute ago, that these consumption production systems also have ecological implications, they have ecological footprints, um, and we need to be cognizant of them as well. So I got involved uh, well, about 20 years ago, um, uh, sort of mid-1990s, um, in developing this issue area, this research domain that's come to be referred to as the field of sustainable consumption research and policy. Um, I was living in the UK at the time. I received one of the first um, uh, allocations of public research money for a project on sustainable consumption. Um, that led to a, to a book uh, in collaboration with a colleague by the name of Joseph Murphy uh, called Exploring Sustainable Consumption, Environmental Policy, uh, and the Social Sciences. And, um, um, and this was, was really one of the first attempts to look um, 
through a truly interdisciplinary social scientific lens at consumption practices um, and their relationship to environmental policy making as it was conceived um, at the time. So just a couple of critical caveats when we talk about sustainable consumption. Um, first point is, is that sustainable consumption is not about green consumerism. It's not about buying nominally green products that, uh, that, uh, that we see on an everyday basis up and down the aisles of the supermarket. Um, it's also not about, or it's not solely about efficiency improvements or efficiency gains. Um, in environmental and ecological and sustainability circles, we've long recognized that efficiency improvements in and of themselves have a perverse, perverse tendency to increase rather than to decrease aggregate energy and material throughputs. Uh, something that uh, was recognized as early as the mid 19th century, uh, referred to today as, uh, as Jevons paradox. Um, and also sustainable consumption is not about how we can go about achieving relative decoupling of resource utilization from economic growth. Um, it's more radical than those more mainstream, more widespread um, understandings of how we can, can manage to engineer ourselves a, a, a more sustainable future. Um, it's, uh, it's about how we can achieve absolute reductions or absolute decoupling in energy and materials utilization. Um, and in this sense, the field of sustainable consumption uh, research uh, begins to back up quite closely on uh, ongoing interest in the notion of post-growth, um, as well as in the idea of degrowth, um, a concept that's received quite a bit of attention in European environmental policy, sustainability policy, advocacy circles over the, over the last decade. So sustainable consumption, or sometimes what's referred to as sustainable consumption and production, um, has had for the past 20 years a quite prominent role within uh, circles of environmental, global environmental policy making, global environmental politics. Uh, it first landed on the global agenda. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember back to 1992, there was a seminal um, uh, uh, conference organized under the auspices of the United Nations, Global United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. Uh, held in Rio de Janeiro, it gave rise to a, um, a, 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 a significant document called Agenda 21. And uh, when you begin to burrow into Agenda 21, you find in one of those chapters uh, significant attention devoted to the notion of sustainable consumption. And that chapter in part says, all countries should strive to promote sustainable consumption patterns. Developed countries should take the lead in achieving sustainable consumption. And so this emphasis on consumption and the role of consumers in advancing a sustainability agenda um, has been with us now for two decades. It was written into the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, agreed last year, um, and the specific language uh, went along these lines, sustainable lifestyles and sustainable patterns of consumption and production with developed country, developed country parties taking the lead, play an important role in addressing climate change. And then finally, just to give you another touchstone um, on the role of this notion of sustainable consumption at the global level, um, that uh, uh, last year the United Nations adopted what are known as sustainable development goals. And one of those goals is um, is devoted to, um, if not explicitly, sustainable consumption to the idea of responsible consumption. Um, a number of countries have begun to develop national sustainable consumption plans to, um, yep, sorry, got one slide behind. 
One, uh, 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 two countries that have been prominent in this regard, um, um, uh, Sweden and Germany. We could also add um, 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 France, Switzerland, and even most re recently, uh, Chile has developed a national um, sustainable consumption plan. Um, and then just to round out the picture a little bit further, um, we need to um, fully recognize that there's a tremendous amount of social movement activity, social innovation occurring at the grassroots level um, as communities, individuals seek to uh, create uh, consumption practices, consumption patterns, consumption systems that are significantly less reliant on large-scale energy and material um, throughputs. So that's um, sort of a brief background on, on what sort of brought me or what sort of carried me to the point at which I sort of embarked a couple of years ago on the process of, uh, of writing this book. So let me kind of thrust myself now into some of the more um, explicit content um, that, uh, that the book discusses. So an important point of departure for this volume um, is the changing fortunes of the middle class, that in the period following the Depression and uh, continuing on through the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, we experienced in the United States, as well as in quite a number of, uh, of the United States' peer countries, um, very significant increase in the size and robustness of middle class. Um, and that the fortunes of the middle class and the size and scope of the middle class began to decline precipitously beginning in the early 1980s. And this is a social phenomenon that no doubt um, everyone in the room here is, uh, is distinctly familiar with. And so, so recognizing that the middle class has experienced a couple of decades of, of rather tough times, um, I pose the question, and I seek to answer the question in the book, is can consumer society persist in the face of a shrinking middle class? Uh, and um, in an effort to begin to get a handle on that question, I identify five primary reasons um, that I see as evidence of a faltering consumer society. And this requires looking beyond the advertising and the marketing and the product promotionalism, you know, that is so much a part of our, our everyday lives, almost an inescapable part of our every li everyday lives. But that's really the, the sort of shiny surface of a consumer society. Um, and that if we really want to understand the macro structural underpinnings of what has been responsible for first creating and then subsequently reproducing consumerist lifestyles, we need to dig quite a bit deeper. And um, the factors that emerge from this digger deeping include the following. So first of all, there's the issue of demographic aging in the United States and elsewhere. That consumer society developed um, in its most salient form in the decades following World War II and has tracked very closely the life course of the baby boom generation born in the, uh, the, uh, the years following World War II as that population cohort continues to age uh, and as its acquisitive and um, um, materialistic propensities continue to change, uh, that it's having significant implications for, um, for material throughput. Um, uh, second factor, and there's you know, been endless conversation about this, as there well should be uh, in this workshop over the last couple of days, uh, increasing income inequality that um, is creating circumstances, and I'll talk a little about this in, a, in further detail in a moment, 
creating circumstances in which sizable portions of the population are financially losing their capacity to participate as consumers in the customary and conventional sense. Third factor, and again, this is at the heart and center, I think, of this research community, um, is the, 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 the growing demise or decline of wage-based employment and the fact that, uh, that large numbers of people are, 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 are now subjected to much more volatile, uncertain uh, income streams that then make it much more difficult to plan large-scale purchases, particularly for big-ticket items like homes and cars, which really sit at the center of consumerist um, lifestyles. A fourth factor is inadequate public investment. This is a feature of neoliberalism, uh, most explicitly during the period since the 1980s. Uh, we need to recognize that private consumption by individuals and, individuals and households sits on a base of public investment um, and that your car, for instance, is only as valuable as the quality of the roads that it drives on. And as the public infrastructure has deteriorated, that's had implications for individual and household level consumption. Um, and then finally, um, and uh, I've been struck by, 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 by the fact that this is not an issue that has, has really risen to the surface, at least from, from my perspective within this uh, research community, is a, is a set of changing values, norms, mores, uh, lifestyle preferences on the part of mo the millennial generation. Uh, we're seeing this today in terms of declining interest and capacity on the part of millennials to buy homes. Um, that's now beginning to show up in uh, the point was raised in the earlier session about declining uh, uh, home ownership rates in the UK. We're also seeing that in the United States as well as the, as the social and cultural centrality of a home in people's conception of their understanding of a good life. Um, we also see this with respect to cars. Um, transportation planners, transportation policy makers uh, are now engaged in a very um, 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 extensive debate about whether we've reached the moment in time that some have referred to as peak car. Um, and this uh, phenomenon is, 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 is most, uh, most notably recognizable in the, on, the, on the part of, uh, of members of the millennial generation. Um, those of you who have teenage children or post-teenage children have probably noted that your kids have little or no interest in cars. Um, if you turn the clock back 20 or 30 years ago, you know, it was common to see uh, teenagers uh, rolled up underneath the, the, the underside of their cars, learning about the, uh, the machinery, changing the oil, doing simple fixes. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed uh, traveling around the suburbs of New Jersey on Saturday morning to find a 17-year-old, you know, tinkering <laughs> with his car. Um, just the, 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 that, that that energy and that enthusiasm is, is devoted to, you know, their mobile devices and that that emotional energy, that fixation, you know, has very much been transferred from cars to, to, to electronic devices. Um, so, um, the book um, covers a fair amount of ground, and it seeks to highlight and profile a series of strategies that have been talked about at considerable length as offering the promise <coughs> of a more sustainable future or of creating the context to enable people to consume more sustainably. Um, Probably most prominent of those strategies is the emphasis that we hear so much about around this, um, um, this the, around the sharing economy, um, which, um, at least from my perspective, uh, there's painfully little sharing that actually goes on within mainstream conceptions of the sharing economy. But there are facets of the sharing economy that deserve um, attention and are significant. Um, from a sustainability standpoint. 
Um, the book also has a chapter on the maker movement. Um, this is a, a, a social um, a mobilization, um, 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 active expression of interest on the part of growing numbers of people in, in, in manufacturing, creating the artifacts of their lives on their own. Um, there are commercial ventures that have been developed around uh, uh, what are known as tech shops. Uh, there's the MIT experiment to create a fab lab or a fabrication laboratory. Um, the, uh, the term prosumption uh, was originally coined by Alvin Toffler back in the 1970s. Those who are familiar with, uh, with his work may recall um, enthusiasm that existed at the time around the conflation and co-development of production and consumption um, and the, the, the application of this notion of prosumption, something that's been picked up very extensively by the sociologist George Ritzer um, in, uh, in recent years. Um, and then also the book takes up the, uh, the, the, the case or the issue of economic localization, economic relocalization. Um, the tremendous amount of uh, enthusiasm that has been uh, uh, literally poured into uh, to, to local beer and local food and, uh, and farmers markets. Um, and um, um, and uh, I suppose many of you have probably found yourself over cocktails or in backyard barbecues, you know, arguing endlessly about authenticity the authenticity uh, of particularly locally ascribed products and, uh, and making distinctions between local and hyper-local. And, uh, and, uh, and this has you know, become a feature of our, of our consumerist lives. It's a little bit more dubious as to the degree to which relocalization represents an efficacious sustainability strategy. And the book takes up some of those, uh, those arguments. But, uh, what I'd like to talk about in the, uh, the time I have remaining um, here this morning is a chapter that I, that I never even imagined or anticipated writing when I began this project, um, and, uh, but became apparent about two-thirds of the way through, um, which required me to fundamentally rethink many of the premises of the book. Uh, and that's a chapter on the effects of digital automation um, on provisioning systems. So I'm going to um, um, sort of cover in, uh, in reasonable detail some of the, uh, the content that appears in the book around uh, digital automation um, and, uh, and consumption um, and, uh, and provisioning systems. And so um, just to be clear, when we talk about digital automation, we're focusing here on, um, on, uh, on deployment and innovation.